We're in a series, a Sunday night series, Word Rooted, Prayer and Worship, Keeping Your Heart Close to the Flame. The topic tonight, I, I tried to find the right words. These are older words, but I think you'll know what I mean by them. A strategy for prevailing prayer. Prevailing prayer as opposed to, there's a way of praying that you pray yourself into skepticism. You can pray yourself into skepticism by ignoring some of the basic scriptural injunctions, teachings, and commandments about prayer, where you, you continue to say the words, but because they're in a way so off target, rather than benefiting your soul, and, and maybe no one's ever said this out loud to you before, you can pray in such a way that you you pray yourself into doubt. Prevailing prayer is prayer that is in some way, we said right at the very beginning of this series, prayer nourished by God's promise. And I mentioned Luther. Martin Luther said how he loved to pray, rubbing God's ears with his promises. I thought that was a great phrase. God hasn't promised to answer just any kind of prayer that anyone chooses to offer. Prayer has to be offered in the right way. It's not works. It's just praying in such a way that our heart has a chance to be actually united with God. There are certain conditions. It's gracious, but that doesn't mean there aren't conditions. To continue to pray in that way is, as I said, you can pray yourself into doubt and skepticism. What I want to do tonight, quite quickly, you'll see, I want to talk about three important principles, and under the second one, there's a couple of sub points, but basically three big ideas. To prevail in prayer, we need to pray in the will of God. And to pray according to God's will means, well, several things, but at least two things, if we're going to just get down to basics. Praying in the will of God means asking for the things that God delights to do. 1 John 5.14, and this is the confidence that we have toward him, that is toward God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Now, I get it. True enough, it's sometimes easier said than done, both being finite and fallen. I can't always lay claim to an absolute knowledge of God's mind. I get that. But, but there are at least some things to start out. There are some basic things that I know are always according to the will of God. I know my spiritual growth is always God's will, even if I sometimes object to his means of producing it. I know that my spiritual growth is God's will. I know that reaching the lost is God's will. Even if we sometimes struggle with his timing, you have a loved one you've been praying for for years. They're not saved. They're far from God. I get that there are timing issues where God tests our faith, but we know that it is his desire to reach the lost. Third, we know glorifying his son, Jesus Christ, that that's always God's will. Even if sometimes he does it through personal persecution, 
demonstrating my loyalty to Christ above all in this world. Sometimes that's a costly glorifying of Jesus, but we know that glorifying Jesus in this world is always God's will. I know that abstaining from an idolatrous love of wealth and pleasure, I know that's always God's will, even if I disagree with him a lot of times about it in the way that I live, but I know that's his will. The point here is that fruitful prayer needs to be aware of God's will as it's revealed in in the scriptures and by the Holy Spirit as he speaks to my mind and heart through the word. Prevailing prayer must seat God's will above my own agenda. So that's, that's one thing for sure. To pray in the will of God, it means asking for the things that God delights to do. And B, praying according to the will of God also means asking for God's will with the right mind and heart. So asking for the right things, that was A. B is asking for the right things with the right kind of heart. Charles Finney, I don't agree with all of his theology, by the way, but on prayer, he said this. Praying according to the will of God means not only asking for such things as God is willing to grant, that was A, but asking in such a state of mind as God can accept. So so in other words, consider this example from Jesus, Matthew 6, 9, and 10. Pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So Jesus teaches his disciples, we call it the Lord's Prayer because the Lord taught it. It's really the disciples' prayer. He's giving it to them. But it anchors, how do you start? What kind of heart do you have to have? It, prayer starts with the hallowing of God's name and the entreating of his kingdom. Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. We say it just about every Sunday night. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Here's how Jesus begins when he tells us what kind of mental framework are we supposed to have. It's not just, sure, he tells us what to pray about. Ask for these things. But before he gets to those things, he outlines the kind of heart, how I should be thinking when I set my heart to pray. Start praying with these two things in the front of your mind. It is certain that these two requests are very close to his heart. Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. Even that needs explanation. Saying those opening words, like we repeat them on Sunday nights, it, it doesn't mean I'm necessarily praying with the right kind of heart. To say your hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, it means that I am I am giving myself. When I pray, I am giving myself in my ambitions, in my actions, in my material goods, in my life, in my family. I am giving myself to the hallowing of your name, the glorifying of your name above everything else and the pursuit of your will and kingdom in all parts of my life. In other words, this is the opposite of James. He says, uh, you you can't, if you're going to pray in faith, you you can't be double-minded. Double-minded isn't just, oh, I don't know if I have enough faith. I think I might have doubts in my, that's not double-minded. Double-minded is I'm, I, my words are saying this, There's parts of my life that I'm living under a different value system. I have different interests. I have my own pursuits. I have my own agenda. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. By the way, here's how I've already decided how I'm implementing the actions of my life. 
Hear again these words by Charles Finney. Take the next petition, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God has not promised to answer this petition unless it is sincerely offered. But to offer it sincerely implies a state of mind that is totally submitted to the revealed will of God as it bears upon all areas of my life. That as far as I presently understand it, okay, there, I accept God's will for my life just as the angels do in heaven. Wow. So it's a, it's a, it's a consecrated heart praying those words. We're not merely told to pray knowing the will of God, but to pray according to the will of God. Do you see the difference between those two things? Not just knowing the will of God, but according to the will of God. In other words, making sure I'm, I'm lined up there. That's how I, to the best of my ability, to the best that I understand it, I'm consistent. This is the direction I am pointing my life in. My prayer and my life, they're not perfect, either one of them, but they are both moving in the same direction. I mean, you can think of the examples of when we don't do this. Every time, even in the body of Christ, every time we celebrate God's amazing grace and forgiveness and hold a grudge to someone else in the church. See, that's, that's what Finney is talking about. Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Yours is the kingdom, but I like to rule my own life. So, all of those things come under that first point. To prevail in prayer means praying according to the will of God. Number two, to prevail in prayer, we must pray with a conscience void of any offense. I want to talk about this for a minute because I think, I think uh, people have sometimes misgivings about this. I want to look at 1 John for now, 3.22, and then another text from 1 John in a minute. I'm talking about praying with a conscience void of offense. 1 John 3, 20 and 22. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, and he knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. Now, here's how it relates to prayer. If our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God, and, 22, whatever we ask, we receive from him because... We keep his commandments and we do what pleases him. And it's almost as though those aren't exactly the same thing. There's all sorts of things where I can't show you chapter and verse in the Bible. Things that aren't specifically mentioned that exist in today's world. But as I obey God and study his word and pray, I will learn not only the commandments that are there to keep them, but I will learn the kind of things that please him. I will learn his heart. Whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. Now, none of us, I don't think, lives with a, an unblemished scorecard in terms of doing his commandments and always doing what, what pleases him. Maybe you do. I, I don't always. I don't think the text is talking about perfection, but about purity. When I think of purity, I think of, of two things. When I think of purity in my relationship with God, I think, of, I think of devotion in my intentions. There's integrity there. My intentions, my plans, my ambitions, my intentions, and my affections. When I think of inward purity, I think of my intentions and my affections. So, so I know that I have to forgive my brother from my heart or God's not going to forgive me. And so there's someone that's just been consistently irritating me in the body of Christ 
And I just, I, now what I do is I just, I won't speak to them anymore. I, we're not going to fight. We're not going to argue because Jesus says I have to forgive him and I'll just distance myself. Well, the intention of my heart isn't to make that relationship right, is it? Intentions. And then affections. What, what are the things that bring me the greatest joy, the greatest delight? Those two things, intentions and affections, that's a wonderful gauge of inward purity of heart. So to prevail in prayer, here's the second point again. We have to pray with a conscience void of any offense. That means at least two things. This is A and B under point two. Our conscience is clean and clear relationally. You can see that when you look at here, 1 John 3, 16 to 20. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers and sisters. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. I wish I had the text and I was underlining it because I'd like to show you something here. By this, we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our hearts before him. Let me read that sentence again and then I'm going to ask you a question. Think about every word here. Let us love not in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. Here's the sentence. By this, we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our hearts before him. Is this something we do or something God does? Were you listening? By this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our hearts before him. Does that sound like something we do or something God does? We do it, don't we? We're going to reassure our hearts before him. Now you keep reading. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Is that something we do or God does? That's something God does. There's these, there's these two sides here. I'm talking now about praying with a clean conscience, making sure I look into my heart when I'm about to pray. You start searching your heart, deed and truth. By this we by this, we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our hearts before him. So I, I look at my motives. I look at the desires, particularly bitterness, anger, greed. I, I look, I confess, I bring those things. And, and then John says, that there, you'll reassure your heart. You'll reassure your heart. But here's the thing. That can be very introspective. And after a while, I'm not sure, is this just me being negative, down on myself? What's happening here? And that's where John says, but God is greater than our hearts. So I confess, I'm praying. I want to pray with a conscience that's clean. I look into my heart. I want to reassure my heart. If there's anything that I see that isn't right, I shouldn't have said that. That entertainment, that doesn't fit into my life that relationship that's gone sour, or that relationship that I've started that I had no business starting, okay? And I bring it to Jesus, I bring it to Jesus, and I bring it to Jesus. And I have to do that all the time to keep my heart, my conscience clean. And then on top of all that, there's the devil who likes to condemn me for every failure. Sure, you confessed it. You, don't you think, you don't think that God can just erase that just like that, do you? And, and that comes into play in my prayer life. Because there's nobody who wants to muck up your prayer life like the devil. And the way he will do it is he will confuse genuine repentance that helps me reassure my heart and condemnation that he loves to bring to bear over and over again. And that's why there's this role that I have. I search my heart and I bring it to the cross. And then there's God. He's greater than my heart. He knows that I'm that I'm bringing these things. He knows the enemy is there to mess me up. And he says, you're forgiven. No condemnation. 
There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. So there's that balance between what we do needs to be done. Cleaning, house cleaning. And there's the work of God in bringing peace and assurance and confidence to our heart. So praying with a clean conscience, that's point two. A, our conscience is clean and clear relationally. Now on to the second part, B, under point two. I'm obeying the law of God in all known areas of my life. I get that in 1 John 3, 22. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. So there's this the requirement isn't perfection. I can't reach that in this life, but the requirement is spiritual attentiveness. I'm obeying the will of God, the commandments, the things that please him. I am bringing those things to bear in my life. Now I want to say something that you won't like. Well, you might like it. The text says, if I'm going to pray with a clean heart and conscience, and I'm going to pray effectively, I need to make sure that I am obeying the commandments, the commandments of the Lord, and I need to be doing the things that please Him. And assumed, assumed in those instructions is, I am making myself available to the means by which God will teach me his word and teach me his way. And here's what I mean by that. I couldn't tell you the number of times in the 40 years that I've been in this church that I'll be with someone somewhere talking about their spiritual life or what's going on in the church. And they'll ask a question. Just I'm just this is just a for instance. They'll ask a question about the nature of the atonement and what we believe about the atonement and the shed blood. And I'll say something like, well, you know, we're going over that on Sunday morning, and I've been teaching in pretty much detail about that. And they'll say, oh, yeah, but it's summer. We're up at the lake in the summertime. Or, you know, Pastor Don, you don't say much about same-sex marriage. And I'll say, you know, we did. I did a whole series on that a few years ago on Sunday nights. Transgenderism and same-sex relationship. Oh, but we don't come to church Sunday night. Oh, okay. And after a while, you start to think, you know, this, I don't know whose fault it is that these people don't know these things by now. But I'm pretty sure it's not mine if I'm faithfully teaching all those things from God's word. Somebody has to take the time to say, you know what? If I go once a month, I'm missing 80% of what I need to learn from God's word for my life. And it's going to affect my prayer life. Do you hear my heart in that? I'm not scolding anybody. I'm just saying when God says to pray aright, it's knowing his commandments and it's knowing what pleases him. And there's this assumption behind John's command that people are availing themselves for opportunities to learn. And that's a really important thing if you're going to pray with confidence and have a conscience void of offense. We keep his commandments. We do what pleases him. Three, and this is the last point. To prevail in prayer, we pray according to the will of God. To prevail in prayer, we pray with a conscience that's clean and void of offense. To prevail in prayer is to pray with truth governing the inward life. Psalm 51, 6. Behold, You delight in truth in the inward being. And you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. John says that prayer is fueled by doing what pleases him. And now the psalmist tells us in no uncertain terms that it's it's the inward life. Truth in the inward being, it delights God. Have you ever noticed David, he has that prayer after his sinful relationship with Bathsheba and the murder of Uriah. And as he 
confesses this. He's praying. And he says, for you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You are not pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. And the striking thing about that is those sacrifices, there were picturing in the Old Testament what access to God was all about. And that's what makes the psalmist's words so telling. He says there's, there is no real pathway to God. There is no real pathway to God without truth on the inside. So, so what that means is, I guess a final, a final wrap-up is, I, I care more about what God thinks of what's going on in my heart than what anybody else can see and observe of my outward life. That I, I'm making sure, I'm making sure that I'm, I'm the real deal on the inside, pleasing in his sight. We, you know, we take time on a service like this and we pray together. And it would be a good thing the next time you're in prayer groups. Not on the list probably, but to... Uh, Someone in your prayer group say, create in us a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within us. We thank you, Lord, for the access that we have. It's called the throne of grace because we need grace and help, particularly in our praying. And help us just in the things we've discussed tonight, these three basic building blocks of prevailing prayer that, Father, you'll teach us to treasure them, to implement them. When we get to heaven, I'm sure every one of us is going to look back at our sojourn here on earth and wonder why we didn't pray more. Draw us to your throne, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.